will continue. Sorry for the break in connection. So I was trying to express the fact that oftentimes saints misunderstand this reciprocal aspect of the responsibility of the saints. Now, when we do not love God in our hearts, obstacles and hindrances, when they strike, they will do the job they need to do. But the way it works is that if we fulfill that reciprocal aspect of our responsibility, then we have the advantage that that problem will work out for our good. Unfortunately, because certain times saints do not meet this first and basic condition of loving God, it will not work out for the good of the individual. And when that happens, the individual becomes bitter and hateful towards God. In loving God, I must express that we express to him that we prioritize him, that God means to us, number one in our life, that we give up our fleshly desires since we know that our fleshly desires will always conflict with our spiritual responsibility. It means that we are willing to avoid anything that will complete with his glory. Although nothing really depends upon us. And I have to express that. Although we will try to do good, we will be righteous, it does not really depend on us. It is by grace that we stand. Yet, when the Lord demands our contribution, we have to comply with him. And this is important. It is our compliance that allows all things to work well for our good. And that's why Romans is saying that in, in verse 28, chapter 28, uh, verse, eight uh, verse 28, chapter 8, it says, we know that all things work in all things, good works for those who love God, who have been called according to the purpose of God. But I'll tell you the beautiful part. When the scripture says all things, it means all things. Even when my life is in danger. Yes, it means all things. Even when my honor is in jeopardy, yes, it means all things. Even when my prayer response is delayed, yes, in all things. It is easy to understand, dear friends, when we surrender to the sovereignty of God. Because somebody can be hearing my voice now and say, Pastor Tony, I don't understand. How can it work out for my good when God exposes my life to death? How can it expose? be to the good, to my good, when I'm not able to get the promotion that I deserve or want. Because if the individual learns to surrender to the sovereignty of God, it will turn out for our good. And it is simple. With God, nothing is impossible. Because he's all powerful, he's eternal, and he's unchangeable. And therefore, you and I can trust him even in the darkest time and in the deepest and hardest obstacles in our lives. One of the beautiful things also that obstacles can pro provoke in us is that obstacles can be used to produce fruit of character in us. It is not enough to say we are Christians and the fruit of our Christianity cannot be seen. And sometimes it takes the buffeting, the hindrance, the, the obstacles to provoke the growth of those character fruits in us. In the book of Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces. That's the key here, that we know because we already love God, suffering produces. 
And what are the things that suffering produces? It produces perseverance. That means that I have to hold on in the face of temptation, in the face of suffering. I do not give in to it. It does not only produce perseverance, it produces character. It produces hope. And we know that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is extremely important for you and I as saints to understand this aspect that, yes, obstacle is not palatable. I, nobody should live to say I am living for obstacles. But at the same time, obstacles produces fruit. It does not only produce fruit, that fruit develops our character and make us stable and viable members of the kingdom of God. In the book of Peter, chapter one, verses six to nine, this is what Peter has to say on it. It says, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though for now, for now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trial. You may have to face all obstacles, but he says in verse seven, these obstacles have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, obstacles are used to test the genuineness of our faith. Are we for God or we are against God? Are we following God because of what we are looking for or we are already God's people? He says they have come so that the proven genuineness of our faith of greater what than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, in glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. That means that as I am able to conform and confront obstacles right now, they, they should be so solid that they can be compared even better to gold that perishes, that at the end of it all, I will be so refined that when heaven see me, they will say praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. Verse 8, he says, though you have not seen him, you love him, you see? And even though you do not see him now, you have believed in him and are filled with inexpressible, glorious joy for you are receiving the end of your faith and that is the salvation of your soul. Dear friends, obstacles may provoke suffering. Nobody is saying it does not. But the essence of such hindrance is to test our faith. And so that we will not be found deficient in any way. And that is why the apostle encourages us to rejoice even in our suffering. And Recently, in my personal life, I have begun to add to my prayers, thanksgiving to the God of delay in my life. And so when something breaks, when something is delayed, when somebody cheats me or steals, I still find the opportunity within that to say, God, thank you for this delay. Thank you for this. Because I know that God is using it to work out things for my good. And I think that as saints, this is the place that we are called to all be. Another thing that comes out of obstacles is that obstacles are used to produce the fruit of humility in us so that we do not fall. I have noticed that when people want God to do something for them, when you want to be healed, they are very humble. Everybody is always humble. You are looking to have a child, you are very humble. You are looking for a job, you are very humble. But the moment the job comes and you begin to earn millions, you begin to grow feathers, you begin to zoom through the streets, your head is always looking up, nobody cares, you don't care about anybody, because now you are now drawing strength from the fruit of the blessings that God has given you. And one of the things that God does not want is that he does not want his children to be idolaters because idols compete with the glory of God. And one of the things that God allows is that once the saints or the children of God begin to become proud and be self-deceit or deceptful, God will allow 
hindrance to come. The reason is simple. God knows our substance very well because he made us. He knows that without his grace, our tendency will always be towards sin and idolatry. And therefore, to prevent us from falling, he allows certain obstacles into our lives to draw our attention to what is important in our Christian race. Brother Tony, Pastor Tony, whatever you want to call me, what of all the bad things that happen? God uses it, even that, to draw our attention so that we do not fall into the pit. Every time that a person becomes proud, one of the things that does is that you don't see what is in your front again. And that's the definition of pride. In the, in the, in the Hebrew or the Greek word, it's like your chest is swollen. When your chest is swollen, you don't see what is in your front. That's the definition. And God wants to deflate it so that you can see the pit in your front. And if you don't see the pit, the danger of falling is very high. And so God uses obstacles or problems and hindrances to come our way so that we are drawn back onto the path of our true Christian race. And God also uses these obstacles as he's humbling us to make a way for us to escape from that temptation. And this is what I have seen in my life. When I am under pressure from something, my intensity of prayer goes up. Everybody, if you think you're going to lose your job, you start praying. If you hear they're going to lay people off, you start praying. And, and God allows that to happen so that they can, you can be drawn back onto the path of your true Christian race. And, and this is what the Apostle Paul was talking to the Corinthians. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 beginning, he said, I must go on boasting. If I must boast, there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of body, I do not know. Only God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows. Was caught up to, the, to paradise and had inexpressible things. Things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that. But I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I'm speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted. But what is what I do or say, all because of this surpassing great revelations, therefore in order to keep me from becoming conceited, conceited means self-deceit, where your chest will fool. That is what pride is. And then I cannot sit down. And Paul says, God didn't want that to be my portion. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more, more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insult, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, that is when I am truly, truly strong. Dear friends, before somebody will start asking questions, okay, God, uh, bro Brother Tony, I agree that obstacles are good. But what of, what of when demons are attacking me? Well, it works out for good if you love God. But what of Satan? It works out for good when you love God. Because you see there, Paul said, God gave me a thorn, a messenger of the Satan. I am not saying that hindrances are good. I have not said that. I'm just saying that they have their way. They have their purpose. Good things can come even when we face those temptations. I do not know who this afternoon is listening to the sound of my voice or is under the influence of my voice, but I would like to say this, that God is a good father. 
He knows our heart. He does not, he's not like the kings of this world or even parents who may take the light sometimes and be mean to their children. God is far from being that person because he's not man. He cannot lie. He's not us. He himself said, I know your friend. I know you are weak. I will not always be angry at you. And God himself said that. He said, I will not even deal with you as much as you deserve. And so this afternoon, as I bring the sermon or teaching to an end, I would like to encourage somebody, wherever you are, wherever you are under the sound or the influence of my voice, that don't be hateful. Don't become bitter. Don't give up because of what you may be going through right now. Because you may just be going through it for your own good. God may be saving you. God may be using it to take away the trash and the things that may keep you from seeing his face when the real time comes. I would like to encourage you as I bring this sermon to an end to say, Lord, I thank you even for the obstacles and the hindrances that are in my life. Tell the Lord, I surrender to you. I surrender to your sovereignty. I glorify you because you are faithful. Thank the Lord. Father, we worship you. We give you all the glory. We thank you even for the obstacles, for the hindrances, for the pain, for the inadequacies that we may have right now. Because we love you, Lord. I know that all of this problem will work out for our good. Father, may your name be glorified in the mighty and the holy name of Jesus. I would like to bring this final aspect of this sermon to an end, to tell that person, that man, that woman, rejoice even in your suffering. And for those who have not made that commitment with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I want you to know that the blood of Jesus has been paid, not only for the saints, but for the sins of the world. All that you need to do is to say, yes, Lord, yes. I accept your sacrifice. If you would say that, then your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. May, your, may, may the Lord be blessed in the mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.